Gibraltar is blessed with a rich variety of natural and human history. The rock and the town below have been home to many cultures and people over the centuries. The artifacts, monuments and memories that remain become our heritage, a common inheritance which we all share. And as Gibraltar moves forward and grows, it is up to us as a society to make sure this heritage endures and becomes a part of our future as well. Leading this effort is the Gibraltar Heritage Trust, an independent statutory body entrusted with the preservation of our heritage, whose aim it is to ensure that modern Gibraltar retains history and heritage at its heart. The importance of being able to chronicle and record historic events is one of the most powerful gifts that the human species possesses. Our ability to pass down knowledge has allowed humans to learn and be enlightened by the experiences of our ancestors. With a rich history and many different points of view present throughout the ages, Gibraltar is rich in stories, both big and small, which are worthy of remembrance. The Gibraltar Heritage Journal, which has been published for the last 28 years, brings together contributions of many individuals, keen to either add their own experiences or through research, flesh out historic events to fill out the history of Gibraltar to form what is now a substantial body of work in 28 volumes. The journal goes right back to 1993 and it came about almost by accident because originally the journal was not produced in Gibraltar and it was not produced by the Heritage Trust. It was the journal of the Friends of Gibraltar Heritage and they'd been created just slightly before the Trust, and they were raising funds for, for Gibraltar in order to completely renovate the City Hall. And a dinner was organised in London. And instead of having a brochure, which is the normal thing that would have been done at a fundraising dinner, the idea came up on the part of the Treasurer of the Friends of Gibraltar Heritage that there should be some kind of a souvenir journal or souvenir publication in order to show the importance of the City Hall and to showcase what the building uh, means in terms of Gibraltar's heritage. Tito Benedi, he was a member of the board of the Friends of Gibraltar Heritage living in the UK at the time and he was approached and invited to prepare a journal and he did so in all of three weeks which is really quite a remarkable achievement. And that particular publication was so well received, it was decided that uh, there should be a further one the following year. Then year three, there was no journal, because at the time there was a discussion going on between the Heritage Trust and the Friends of Gibraltar Heritage Society in the UK. And it was Alexis Almeida, who was then the, the chairman of the Heritage Trust, who agreed with the Friends uh, that it should be an annual publication and that it should be a joint publication. And from then onwards, it was produced annually. People were amazed. They were really, really uh, astonished at, at uh, how interesting it was. And there was a lot of new information together with bringing back some information that had been forgotten. And at the time, there were very few books on Gibraltar and Gibraltar history being published. So there was a demand for that. People wanted to preserve Gibraltar's heritage, wanted to know more about Gibraltar's history. So this was starting to feed that particular demand. So there was a hungry market that wanted more. The journal consists and has consisted over the years of a variety of different types of articles. On the one hand, you have the very, very academic article, uh, which is uh, beautifully written, well-researched, very well-referenced. Remember that all along, the journal has maintained and insists on maintaining a very high academic standard of excellence. Then over and above that, you have people's reminiscences. Now, these are very important. You've got to gather what people recall before they are gone. So there are a number of, of uh, very interesting articles. Pop Garese uh, wrote an article on what it was like to go to 
the line wall preparatory school where NatWest Bank is today, when that was a boarding school back in the 1920s. You've got uh, Isaac Benunes, uh, who recalls what Gibraltar was like at the time of the Spanish Civil War. And more recently, you've got very important articles written, for example, by Sir Joe Bossano, uh, writing on his involvement in the trade union movement. Now, these are things that, if they are not recorded, they could be lost. And so we are all the richer for these persons having written. So we've got articles by uh, uh, Sol Serruya, by Sir Joshua Hassan, uh, by Eric Canessa. These are all persons who've now left us. But what they had to say is there for all to see and to read. So that's particularly important. So uh, altogether, what the aim of Tito Benedi, who was the long-term editor of the journal, his aim was to produce what might be termed an encyclopedia of Gibraltar history. And I, I think it's, it's a very rich tapestry that has been woven. And it, it's really an invaluable reference source, both in Gibraltar and overseas. It's often the case that uh, somebody who is a student of Gibraltar history and looking up the records, whether they are uh, records in, in uh, a library or whether it's in the archives, there's always a risk, a very serious risk, that one will be uh, completely twisted away from one's main purpose and invited to go down alluring uh, alleyways, uh, exploring all sorts of anecdotes and uh, different aspects that one never suspected. So we've got in a fairly recent journal an article by Roy Clinton who discovered the original uh, Mediterranean steppes route, which is not the route that we have today. I've, I've always loved med steps. There's quite a, a journey from the beginning to the final article that appeared in the journal. And the, the first thing that um, sparked my curiosity was, was a map I found of the Upper Rock in 1823, which is a survey. And it showed med steps quite clearly, but when you traced back the route of med steps, it didn't actually follow the path that we know at the moment. And I thought, well, that's strange. I couldn't understand what was going on. I then um, started thinking, well, what can I find out about med steps? What's been written about it? Um, and I went back to George Palau. He'd written a little bit about uh, Lady Chetwin's chair and, and, and a little mystery about it and the, the poetry in the back of the chair. And he had his theories on it. And, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I was looking through one of the books that I have on the military fortifications on the Upper Rock. And there was a, a detail of the map, um, which I thought you could just about make med steps. And this was a map that apparently had been done by O'Hara. But that map wasn't here in Gibraltar. That was actually in London. So what I did was, on one of my trips to London, I, I went to Kew Gardens, asked for that map. And to my surprise, it wasn't a small map. It was an enormous map, a map that was like two tables long. But it clearly showed med steps. And it clearly showed that it had been built by, by O'Hara in a period between 1787 and 1790. So that gave me a very important, well, it didn't just give me an important clue. I think it sort of solved the puzzle in terms of what was the original design of med steps and, um, and when, when it was built. It actually gave me the date. Yeah? And then it's just a question of filling in the pieces, um, trying to tell the story. Uh, which would involve uh, going to the Gibraltar archives, um, having a look at what O'Hara was writing to people about, um, looking at histories which were contemporary to the period, and, and then trying to uh, put it all together in a way that made sense. Well, if you got up to this point up the rock, you would have needed one of these, which is a pass from the governor, which gave you permission to go up to the very top of the rock. Without one of these, you've probably been arrested. 
So from here on, you're going to want to go up to O'Hara's Tower, the Mediterranean Road and Med Steps. But of course, we all know Med Steps as heading off in this direction, which is one we all know. But in fact, this is actually the path to Martin's Cave. And Martin's Cave, which was discovered in 1821, was actually this path that came along a lot later than uh, the actual building of the Mediterranean Steps. So if you come up to this point, and you would have come up probably by, by donkey or mule, uh, instead of heading off in this direction, in fact, we would have gone off in this direction up towards St. Michael's Cave. And you would have gone up either on foot or on a donkey until you got up to a junction with the road that's called Mediterranean Road now, and in those days it was called the Levant Road. And that, in fact, is the actual correct path to go up to Mediterranean Steps. So having walked up from uh, Jews Gate, we now come to this junction where the path carries on up towards St. Michael's Cave, which is what we now know as a shortcut to St. Michael's Cave. That carries on up that way. But behind me is in fact the original route that led to Med Steps. And this was uh, known as Levant Road. Uh, today we know it as Mediterranean Road. And it actually leads to a small cottage that we, we so sort of colloquially know as the Governor's Lodge on the Upper Rock. And that's where we're heading now. By having walked up Levant Road uh, behind me, you would come to this spot, uh, which is known as Lady Chetwin's Chair. And this was actually carved out in 1790 uh, by Captain Douglas, who was the officer, in fact, Scottish officer in charge of uh, the building of the whole Levant Road and Mediterranean Steps area. And what is unusual about this particular feature is you will not find anything like it in Gibraltar. And there is actually an inscription on the back uh, to Mrs. Chetwind. And there's a bit of poetry written on it, which unfortunately has been damaged, uh, not in recent times. It was certainly damaged uh, back in 1884 when people were asking, well, what is the complete inscription? And to this day, we don't know what the complete verse is as to what the poetry that was written on this chair. And no doubt the officers would come up to here with their ladies and uh, sit down and enjoy the view. And believe me, the view from here is spectacular. It's a view which you don't get anywhere else. And of course, having walked up or come up a mule, this would be in the perfect spot to uh, stop, have a drink and a picnic before carrying on on what was the original route of Med Steps. Well, I think it, it all started when I was a kid and, and uh, George Blau was writing his books about Gibraltar's history. And as they came out one by one, and we're talking about the 1970s, I, I would go out and, and get them and read them. And the stories he told uh, were not things you were, were necessarily taught at school in those days anyway. From that time on, I always had a curiosity for Jib's history and, and, and what there is around us. Yeah? The way I started developing my, my interest in history was really uh, by collecting books, bit by bit. And, and what I have done since I was a kid, since that first George Blair book that I bought, I've now tried to get every book I can find uh, on the subject of Gibraltar. And 
as a result over probably a lifetime of collecting, I've now got effectively my own library. Having got these books, is what I'm trying to do now is uh, put them to use. So what I've realized is I've actually got a, a great resource now, which I can use for research. So what I'm trying to do now is put them to work. So what I love doing is, is picking on a topic, uh, such as MedSteps or the Gibraltar Gas Company, and then going into a sort of deep dive into the subject and trying to find as much as I can about it. And I'm not just looking at the, archi the archives in Gibraltar, but also the, the National Archives at Kew Gardens in, in England as well, where there's a lot of material on Gibraltar. But of course, you've got to start somewhere. And where I start is usually in this room with what I have. And then I can then work out what I don't have and then try and connect the missing pieces. A bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You have one or two pieces of a jigsaw and you have a, a kind of sense of, of there's, there's more to find out. And until you get the last piece of the jigsaw, you just can't stop <laughs> uh, because it's a challenge. And, um, and once you get bitten by this bug, um, it's, it's something that you, you end up pursuing as a passion. rather than, It becomes a passion rather than just a hobby. Yeah? Right, so now we've come to the end of the Levant Road and we come to what is the entrance to the first of the two tunnels. This is uh, was known as the Levant Gallery and as you can see it's, it's currently locked and we can't actually carry on this way. But if we were to carry on through, we would come through to the mid part of what we know as Med Steps and lead to what is the second tunnel that we all know and then we would carry on on a normal route of Med Steps. So this, again, as I said, is, is the area which we, we don't really, haven't seen much of, but this is the way O'Hara would have walked along Med Steps, and certainly it's possible even Nelson walked this way because it was built uh, before Nelson's time. So unfortunately at the moment, as I say, we can't go beyond these gates, but we can see through them uh, to the other side, uh, and this was known as the Levant Gallery. And of course, you know, the, the path we just walked, um, when, you, when you look at it, you can see it's much wider, uh, much safer, and much more comfortable, uh, because certainly the, the, the engineers building it uh, had in mind that they would have to bring uh, uh, certainly donkeys and equipment along this road, and they would have made it um, as comfortable as possible and as safe as possible. And, and you just contrast that with the what we think is Med Steps uh, path today, which is in fact St. Martin's Cave path, and you can see the difference immediately. I mean, this was uh, a road that was built uh, for a purpose, uh, the original entrance to Mediterranean Steps. Um, I then found, started then doing more research, and I found the obituary of Douglas himself, who's the guy I, I found out who actually built and designed most of the med steps, and he did Chetwin's chair and uh, the Douglas Cave bench. Right, here we are. This is the entrance to what's known as Douglas's cave. It's obscured by uh, a, a garage structure, but in fact, at the back wall, it's actually a false wall, which is obscuring the entrance to the cave. So it's, it's a bit like a, a, a blast wall. You go in and then turn left and you're in the, the cave area. Now what's interesting about this cave is this is the same, in my view, the same Douglas as the Douglas that did Lady uh, Chetwin's chair, or Mrs. Chetwin's chair. And in here I think is what uh, was referred to as Prince Edward's chair, uh, although it looks more like a bench to me. When you take this into account, this bench in here, plus Lady Chetwin's chair, there's another chair at the top of Med Steps. You can see this is all uh, part of the same uh, uh, scheme. And in fact, above the entrance to the cave, there is a carved there, Douglas Cave, and underneath it, it does say 1790. So, so the actual feature inside is 1790, and it appears 
on the maps of the area by O'Hara, uh, which are in the public records office in uh, Kew Gardens, uh, which shows it clearly as having been here in 1790. So this road that O'Hara built, um, this, this cave here, which I, I believe was carved out by, by Captain Douglas, it all forms part of the same scheme, um, which is all part of the Med Steps complex. So here we are at the site of uh, what we know today as O'Hara's uh, gun battery. But of course, um, this wasn't built as a gun battery. This was actually built um, for the site of a watchtower. And where we are now, and we can't see any remains of it, but more or less here, there would have been a probably 15 meter high tower, which uh, was called St. George's Tower. And in O'Hara's time, the idea was uh, that this would serve as an alternative uh, signal station because the, the old one uh, would be badly affected by Levanta. And we know later on indeed the signal station did move down to Windmill Hill because of problems with the weather. Some historians have suggested that O'Hara tried to build a tower high enough to see into Gaddis, but I very much doubt that that would have been the case. Even the military engineers of the day would have known that, that would have been possible. O'Hara's tower, as it became to, to be known, uh, unfortunately was struck by lightning uh, shortly after it was built in 1790. Uh, so we know that by 1809 it was in ruins. And so this area became, um, as it were, a bit of a picnic spot. Uh, you had some very picturesque ruins of the tower, um, nothing much else in the area, uh, certainly nothing of military significance. And so it became um, a, a leisure area uh, where officers would come with their wives uh, to enjoy the scenery. Uh, but certainly from here you get spectacular views of the Straits. And the, in terms of what remains of the tower, uh, in terms of the base of the foundations, there's not really much to see. In fact, there is nothing to see. But there, are, there is, I think, a one outhouse, which is probably part of the original um, buildings uh, that supported uh, the, the, the garrison that would be looking after the tower at the time. Of course, O'Hara was uh, an interesting character. He did become uh, eventually governor of Gibraltar in, in 1795. Uh, but before then, before he came to Gibraltar, he was actually in America uh, fighting the American War of Independence, which of course uh, he lost. And he's, he's got the strange accolade of being the one person who surrendered to Washington and also to Napoleon later on, because Cornwallis uh, suddenly felt unwell and therefore uh, it fell to O'Hara to surrender to uh, uh, George Washington. Uh, then he came to back to Gibraltar, he was posted here in about 1787 as, as commanding officer. Uh, Elliot was still the governor and Boyd uh, was still a deputy governor. Um, and his task really was to um, reconstruct a lot of Gibraltar that had been damaged in, after the siege and also to build new uh, fortifications, new places uh, and new roads. And of course, this area here was part of that great plan. And here we are, the third and final seat in the Med Steps uh, series. And this is a seat that we all know about and no doubt love after a uh, strenuous walk up Med Steps or run, uh, as you choose. Uh, for me, it's usually a walk. But uh, certainly, this, this seat, um, along with the other two seats, I mean, sort of reinforces. Um, the fact that this has nothing to do with anything of military importance or significance or use, but really purely for leisure. What can be more indicative of a leisure area than a nice stone seat carved in exactly the right spot, uh, just as you're reaching uh, the, the end of your energy, having walked up med steps.
The steps themselves is about um, 270, 280 steps. Uh, they actually connect Mediterranean Battery, which overlooks Sandy Bay, up to what would have been St. George's Tower. And the steps themselves are actually on O'Hara's map of 1790. So we know that these steps, plus the Levant Road, Levant Cave, and the whole area was actually built at the same time in the same period around 1790. So Med Steps are, you know, at least 230 years old and it's something worth remembering given that they're still in pretty good shape um, given their age. But the steps that we see today, uh, apart from a few areas where they've had to be repaired, are pretty much, pretty much follow the original uh, scheme of things and as set out in O'Hara's plan, which is in the, the public records office in, in London. You do find that there are 19th century oil paintings, sketches of uh, an officer taking his wife up the rock for a little mini tour on the donkey, stop at O'Hara's tower, taking the view, carry on down. So it became a bit of a, a thing to do was to visit O'Hara's Tower, as it became known, uh, visit the signal station, and, and, and it became a grand, bit of a grand tour of, of the Upper Rock. Uh, and certainly as late as um, 1880s, you know, there, there was a record of, of the governor going up to have a picnic with his family up at O'Hara's Tower. Of course, once uh, it was decided to put uh, uh, modern gun batteries up there, such as now we have you know, the gun battery, a 9.2 gun, at O'Hara's and, and, the, and the previous batteries, I think it starts from about 1880s, the whole area became restricted. So you couldn't really go up Med Steps anymore. And I guess it was only until after the Second World War, well after the Second World War, when these guns were decommissioned, that we can now as a civilian population enjoy walking along Med Steps. And of course, you know, when you start thinking about it, you know, the whole area, uh, you know, Nelson could easily have walked along there because it was contemporary with his time here. And I think, you know, having done all this research, it just gives you a new, a new appreciation for what we have. And, you know, I hope that for, it will get uh, preserved and, and looked after because it is, it is a very old feature of Gibraltar and a fantastic one here. And I think, you know, we, we're lucky to, to have it uh, so well preserved um, for generations to enjoy.